So my name is Adam Muggleton. Uh, thank you for coming to hear me today. I'm going to talk to you about staircase pressurization systems. The systems that nobody really wants to own, like or love. Commissioning the staircase pressurization system is a bit like accepting your Microsoft Office license. You just click yeah, then read it, then do any due diligence, right? So I'm going to talk to you about commissioning from a systems point of view, right? So I've been lucky enough to work in 21 countries and one of the few constants is staircase pressurization systems pretty much suck everywhere and no one owns them. But two, the best approach in my opinion to do this is, is commissioning on a systems basis rather than an equipment basis. So one of the cultural things I've noticed in the, in the US and Canada, there is a, a tendency towards equipment based commissioning rather than systems. So for me there's a chill water system but you know if you're a chiller guy that's just a chiller if you're a fan core guy you're just a fan core right. So this is really coming from a systems perspective and we'll talk to you about uh, commissioning but from the design phase to the construction phase to the actual commissioning phase and breaking commissioning down to functional performance testing and IST. So before we get going can I just have a quick show of hands who in the room is a tab firm or a tab practitioner stick your hand up okay that's about 30 percent 35 percent and who is commissioning everyone else Hoo -hoo, okay good to know should be interesting right let's get going so course description read that right learning objectives so what i want you to take away today is commissioning as a system and a systems approach and taking it from design phase. So one of the things I talk about when I talk at other conferences, commissioning begins in design. Anybody disagree with that? Right. How many people here have experienced starting commissioning from early design phase? Stick your hand up. That's not bad. That's about 60-70%. That's pretty good. Some conferences that number is a lot lower and I guess we can thank Lee for that which is good. So I want to go through design, construction, commissioning. I'm going to talk about some of the codes and the authorities having jurisdiction, how they play into it. And talk about post-occupancy testing as well. So this is me. I work for ASG. We're an international commissioning firm. We've got offices in London, Singapore, Dubai, Riyadh, and expanding. Um, I have a podcast called The Edifice Complex, and I blog every week my nom de plume is building whisperer so obviously didn't get much attention when i was young i need that attention so please hit that subscribe button right so let's get into it what is essential is invisible so in my experience now I'm, i started work on the 1st of december 1980 i'm old right nobody really owns the staircase pressurization system, right? It's always sort of like, oh, he's doing it, oh, the tab guy's problem, the control guy's problem, the fire guy's problem. It's never the main contractor's problem, right? So main contractor is the general contractor in America. So I put this thing out on LinkedIn a little while ago, actually. Who owns it? And this was a response. So who owns responsibility? Let's do a quick poll here. Who thinks the commissioning firm owns responsibility for commissioning the staircase system? Stick your hand up. Only one. You're brave, sir. I hope your PI insurance is, is is well covered. So, in my opinion, the engineer of record owns it, and until that is signed off by the authority having jurisdiction, they own it. Who owns the delivery? In my opinion, that is the general contractor, right? Because it's a system. It involves the stairs, the staircase, the quality of the construction of the staircase the quality of the installation, the doors, the gaskets around the doors, the closers, the whole thing, right? It's not just the air system. The fact that when this, I put this poll out on LinkedIn and it came back with this spread of answers, so 40% think it's a design engineer, 24% the authority having jurisdiction, 15% the main contractor, and 14% commission firm. The fact that that wasn't definitively for one thing tells you there's a lot of confusion out there, right? So, why do buildings not get handed over with zero defects? So you buy a car, do you have any expectation that there's a punch list with that car when you pick it up? No? There's no commission engineers for cars, right? Why is that? Because they work. Right? It doesn't go through your mind that it's not going to start when you turn it on, right? 
My laptop, no commission engineers for that. Why? Because it works. But yet we've been building buildings for 5,000 years and we can't deliver a building with no defects. I've never met a client who says, here's a construction contract, I'm okay with 2,000 defects, I'll see you in three years' time. Said no owner ever, right? But it happens. So there's some, there's some research on this, and the bottom line is, there's a little, little graph there you can see. This was in the UK, where I come from, this accent is British. In the UK, there's a body, it's a bit like the Lawrence Berkeley Labs, they did this whole research on the built environment and they said, why, why do buildings suck? Was basically the question. What are the problems? And the answer was 50% of every problem you will ever have on a building is in the design. So when that goes out to tender, research has shown 50% of every problem is in the design phase, right? Which is why commissioning should begin in design. And then 40% was in construction. So what that means is if you walk around the building site and you see someone pulling something out that's been put in, that is a screw up being fixed, but it's a double economic loss, right? While they're fixing that, that costs time and money, which means also the job's not being progressed. So there's a double economic loss there. So that is actually a disaster if you're a construction firm, right? You don't want that. Now, when you get to life safety systems, there's an issue, right? So no one cares if the fan core unit doesn't really work. You get hot, you get cold, no one dies, right? But we're talking about life safety systems here. So the problem is with staircase pressurization as an example, right? When do you care about that? When the building's on fire and you're running down the stairs, right? Until that point, no one really cares, right? But they are really important, right? Insurance is tied up with it. Life safety is tied up with it. It's a protection route for firefighters, right? It's a way of protecting the building and getting people out. So it actually does matter. Now, going back to the design point here, if you're a design team, what is your job? Actually, I'd argue you have one job, no matter if you're an architect or design engineer. Your job is to produce specifications and drawings that communicate clearly to the construction team what they need to build, right? It's not complicated. Anyone had a set of experience to set of drawings with zero errors and omissions? Stick your hand up. Zero hands up, yeah, of course. So I've been working 40 years, never seen that. It's like the unicorn, you know, it's coming, but it ain't coming really. So, you know, why is there commissioning? Because buildings don't work out the box, right? Why should commissioning begin in design? Because 50%, I'd argue it's higher than that, but 50% of every problem you have is baked in the cake there. But if you can intervene during design with a commissionability design review and find a problem and fix it, that's a pretty low cost solution, right? It's better than ripping something out. So design phase actually matters. Now, the other thing you will never see, you're never gonna see, I don't know, the ashray mag, and there's not gonna be a person on the front doing a grip and grim photograph saying, I've just won an award for best life safety staircase pressurization system. Never gonna happen, right? Who designs these systems? Is it the partner in the office or the super senior engineer? No, right, it's the intermediate person who was not paying attention when they asked for someone to put their hand up, right? So this is a problem, but this is a problem because when you do a life safety system, right? Do you look at this slide? These are all the codes that are relevant. If you're, so if you're North American, if you're American, these are the codes you have to read, analyze, synthesize the information, pull out what matters because codes are prescriptive, right? So, you know, if you're designing the most environmentally friendly, carbon, low carbon, I don't know, VAV system in the world, there is some prescription in that, but a lot of it is engineering license, right? Whereas when you're designing a life safety system, it's really about prescription. And that prescription is in 20 different codes, 20 different standards. Then you've got the authority having jurisdiction have their say as well, right? So, you know, so let's recap. We've given this design task to an intermediate engineer who's probably not being supervised by a senior engineer. And then we're asking them to make sure they've absorbed all this information, synthesized out what they need to do, and then made sure their design meets the prescribed requirements to save somebody's life, right? So my point there is, you know, it is serious. It matters. So, design steps. I'm not, I'm, 
so the slide, by the way, the slides are all in your app, and if you want to copy the slides and you need them, I can send them to you, so don't worry about taking notes. And I don't, I'm not going to read all this out to you, but this is the design procedure we're asking this intermediate person to do, right? We're asking them to synthesize all that information from the codes, then we're asking them to follow this design procedure, right? So they've got to calculate leakage rates through shafts that they don't know the quality of construction on. Leakage rate through doors, they're taking it, the gaskets will work, and then leakage rate through ductwork. But when you see something that says add 50% factor for unknown leakage in shaft, add 15% factor for ductwork leakage, that is not a precise science. Right? When you have to have those fiddle factors in, that tells you a few things. One, it's not a precise science. Two, that means your design has to be robust enough to deal with that, right? It has to deal with the, all the variables of people running up and down stairs, the thing might come on or might not come on, but also it has to deal with variables in design quality, leakage rates, right? And it still has to meet the prescribed performance. So the point here is, even if you are the best designer in the world, there are still a lot of variables in, so your design has to be robust enough. It cannot be fragile. It has to be anti-fragile. God, I sound American there, anti-fragile, anti if you're a Brit. So, there are design objectives, right? So, for, as a commissioning person, I'm always looking, beginning with the end in mind, right? I want to know, okay, well, if one day I'm going to test this system, I need to know how many doors I need open, what flow rate I'm trying to achieve, what pressure I'm trying to achieve, what door force I'm trying to achieve, right? So, designers, it's on them to know that, right? That's one of the first questions I would ask a designer in a design review, you know, are you aware of how I'm going to test this? 50% of the time, the answer is no, actually. But the point is, you've got to know, right? And if you're the commissioning person and the TAP person, in many cases, you've got to know these requirements. Now, every jurisdiction has some different twists on it. And internationally, there's different twists. So a lot of jurisdictions I work in follow a British standard, which is different. But either way, you've got to know, right? So risk mitigation. Again, not going to read this out, but from a design point of view, right? if I'm the intermediate designer designing this, I don't want my firm to get sued. I don't want to get fired. right? So I've got to meet the prescribed requirements. Then I've got to design for robustness. right? Then I've got to make sure it's going to get through the authority having jurisdiction, which is normally a CFD type analysis. right? And then I've got to consider all the other disciplines in it. So the point is, on a design review basis or a commissioning, design review basis, you've got to look at those things as if you designed it. You've got to put yourself in the mind of the designer and you've got to ask yourself these questions. Does this meet prescribed requirements? Is it robust? Is it going to fail? Is it going to come on? Is it going to meet that requirement? Are the door closers correct? Are the door undercuts correct? Right? All these things have to be taken into consideration. So from a design point of view, put yourself in the mind of the designer. From a construction point of view, so this is where we really get into the Microsoft license analogy, right? So a lot of general contractors I've worked with do not really accept that this is their job. Oh, I've pushed that down to the fire engineer. I've pushed that down to the fire alarm person. I've pushed it down to the tab person. Oh, the commissioning guy's going to come in. He's going to sprinkle magic dust on it. It's all going to work, right? No. So as commissioning providers, I think you should really be in conversation as early as possible with the main contractor and try and get them to own a responsibility. So we're talking about the difference here between responsibility and accountability, right? So respond, if I'm accountable for something and I'm the main contractor, the general contractor, I can still delegate responsibility for certain things, right? But I've still got to own the accountability of that. And this is where I think the disconnect exists in a lot of contracting places. It's not an American thing, it's a worldwide thing. So a lot of contractors go, well, I've given that order to the tab guy. That is his problem. Yes, it's his responsibility to do it, but it's the general contractor's responsibility to make sure he does it right, make sure he coordinates with all the other players involved, and make sure the authority having jurisdiction get the demonstration they need to sign it off, right? That's the accountability. So you know, if you're, if you're below that level of accountability, you've always got to push the, the GC to own it because you need cooperation from the GC, right? You need them to be on board with this. So the other problem with construction is stair craces are probably one of the best ways to move man and materials through a building, right? So, you know, very 
I can't, I can't think I've ever seen one construction schedule where they've actually planned to test the staircase properly on a high rise because they always want the staircases over to move people through. So you wind up doing it out of hours for extra money sometimes, right? <laughs> Maybe. So the point is here, if you're involved early, hopefully you're involved from design then you're involved in early construction. The key there, I think, as a commission professional is to advise the main contractor, try and get them on board and give them advice on how to schedule, try and get them to carve out schedule time or, or, or accept early that they're going to do this out of hours, right? So get that scheduling programmed out and get them to understand it is a system. It's not just a bit of duct work blowing some air in the staircase. It's a system that interlinks. So that diagram you see on this slide here is my attempt at a systems diagram. All the components in this diagram are part of the staircase pressurization system, right? So we're talking about the staircase, the fire alarm, the emergency lighting, the door furniture, the construction of the staircase, the interface with the PA system, the interface with the elevators. These are all things that matter. They are all designed to work in concert on that day that there's a fire and everyone's running down the stairs, right? They all interact with each other. This is an IST thing, which we'll come on to. So let's talk about commissioning. There are three definitions, all of which I dislike to various degrees. So I'm in America, right? ASHRAE. This is the generally accepted definition of commissioning. So it's a quality focused processor. <laughs> it's way too long, this definition. I hate it. I'll tell you why I hate it, because it, it uses the word process, right? So the problem with the word process is, it implies if you just follow these steps, everything's going to be great and good and all dandy. So I would argue you can follow a process and still get nowhere. What matters is the rigor brought to that process, the technical ability and expertise brought to that process, the evidence that things have been done. So when you go to a job and you get these really thick binders for the tick list, beware. That is like an inverse correlation to actual work that's been done, right? What matters is testing. So the UK, I had to get the Brit thing in there, right? I'm a Brit. So the UK definition of commission is this, advancement of a system from a state of static completion, i.e. just before power zone, to full dynamic operation in accordance with specified requirements. It's a one-time event. I like that, it's, cut, it's concise, it's systems-based. It doesn't imply process. But the best definition ever is Ronald the Reagan. Trust but verify. Very cleverly used a Russian proverb against the Russians, which I thought was genius, right? But this is it, right? Commissioning answers the how question. How is this building green? How is it low carbon? How does it meet spec? How does it perform, right? The, the authority having jurisdiction, they come and want the how question answered. If you're the authority having jurisdiction come in to inspect and have something demonstrate to you, your question is, how does this meet the spec, right? How can I sign this off? Does it meet spec? So commissioning answers the how question, but you answer that through verification, through testing. It's not sitting in your trailer ticking boxes. I hate the word checklist, right? So checklists have a place, pilots use them, right? To make sure they don't miss anything before takeoff, which I'm very happy about because I fly a lot. So there are some places for it, but Tick lists, checklists, you know, the BSA uses a thing to checklist. And you know, the checklist, the problem with a checklist is if you see a checklist all ticked, it's implied that all the work has been done on that, right? Yet it's super easy to sit in that trailer and just tick that thing, drink that coffee, right? Oof. So beware the big, heavy checklist report, right? You want the how question answered every time. And that's your job as a commissioning person and as a tab person. How does this system meet spec? How does it perform, right? That's what we're about here. So this is the other thing I put out on LinkedIn. The staircase pressurization, who commissions it? And of course, everybody had a different answer to that. So this is an industry that's been putting up buildings for how long? And fire matters, life safety matters, and yet there's no real clear agreement about who commissioned it, right? So I would say, my answer to that question is the commissioning engineer, authority, or agent, whatever part of the world you're in, does it, right? But that person does it as an independent third party and reports objectively on that performance. 
but it is the commissioning engineer's responsibility to test it, but it is the general contractor's accountability to make sure it's all done properly and handed over in accordance with prescribed requirements, right? So this shouldn't be confusing, but again, it is confusing. Now the good news is NFPA have been around a long time. It's driven by insurance, which basically is Latin for money. And there are, in the US, it, there's very well documented requirements and there's very well documented procedures that have to be done. So NFPA three and four, who is aware, put by a show of hands, who is aware and uses these documents? One, two. So that's about five, ten percent of people in the room. Now, I'm shocked always at how few engineers specify these documents or even know they exist. So I'd encourage you as commissioning providers to bring these documents to your clients and use them because there's legitimacy in it, right? NFPA, super legit, right? <laughs> Insurance, super legit. So my point here is, on top of all the standards we had on one of them earlier slides, if you're the designer, if you're the commissioning person, there are standards that are out there. ABC, actually, from, from a tab point of view, ABC even address this, and ABC have standards for balancing, right? NFPF standards for functional performance testing and IST. So we should be using them, right? So it's not just I walk through the job, do some tick lists, wave an anemometer around. It's, no, it's not that. It's what's in these documents. And they do call out the requirement for qualified independent testing. That's what they call outs for. So good on them. I like that. So America's one of the few jurisdictions that have documents dedicated at a really sort of important level to functional performance tests and IST. I'm working on a new commissioning code in the UK to try and get that in there. Anyway, let's, let's move on. So let's talk about the commissioning process, right? From design all the way through to handover. So these are the documents you have gotta get involved because our job is a game of documents, right? It's not a game of thrones. So documents matter, but the content matter, right? So as a commissioning provider, your job is not to take the design responsibility off the engineer. Your job is to review all the design documents out there and check them for commissionability, right? So these are the documents we need. I'm not gonna read them out because you can all read, but really what is really matters here is the owner's project requirements. I love that, that's a good Americanism that's spreading around the world nicely. You know, why, going back to the design thing, you know, why are design documents horrible? One of the reasons is, because owners are not great at asking for what they want. So an owner just says, oh, give me a lead gold building, I want a lead gold building. Actually, that's not really helpful if you're a design engineer or an architect, right? There's a thousand ways to do a lead gold building, probably a million ways, right? So you've got to be specific. So the owner's project requirements, actually, I think is a really important document, but what needs to be included in that is the life safety aspects and the testing that's going to be handled. Because if you start documenting that early, you can start getting that expectation into the tender documents and the bid documents, right? And then the fire strategy, that's a really important one, obviously, because the authority having jurisdiction needs to be on board with that. But these are the documents that are on this list you've got to review as part of your commissionability review. And this really, I'm a big fan of network diagrams and planning. So if you hire me on your job, one, I'm expensive, congratulations. But two, I like to, plan out using logic diagrams, right? So the reason I use logic diagrams, this is like a dimensionless schedule. There's no resources and no time on these diagrams, but you can get people to agree to the basic logic, which is we're gonna do this before this, and this is the order, and we're gonna do that. And then you can say, okay, we've all agreed that, good, everyone's nodding right now, you can put the resources on it. So these are the steps for design phase commissioning. I'm gonna review the OPR, the fire strategy, the drawings and specs, any calculations, and any cause and effects matrix. Do you use that terminology here, cause and effects matrix? All right, I'll explain that later. It's a really important document. And then I'm gonna produce a commissionability report, right? So if you're a commissioning agent, you've gotta show proof of work. We need some footprints in the snow. You can't just go, yeah, I looked at it, it looks all right to me, Bob, see ya. You've gotta write a report. I reviewed these documents. This is what I found. These are the commissioning issues. This is what I suggest and recommend you address. And you've got to do all this without adopting responsibility for design. 
and having your insurance trigger. So the outcome, the output from the design phase commissioning is a commissionability report and also a design phase commissioning plan. So why am I doing a design phase commissioning plan? Because if you map out early before you go out to bid to the main contractor and subcontractors, the commissioning process, who's who in the zoo, who does what when, and that is adopted into the bid documents, then there's no argument later on that you didn't know you were doing commissioning, you didn't know what your part in it was. So I recommend to all my clients that we have a design phase commissioning plan. So let's talk about Dr. Fauci. Right. Now the good news is, before he came along, I was always talking about flattening the curve and no one understood what I was talking about. So again, thank you Dr. Fauci, right? If you take the premise that 50 to 80% of every problem you're going to have in a job is baked in the design cake, and you can, if you're doing a commissionability design review, the game is how many problems can I find and address cheaply before they become expensive? and they become expensive immediately after the contractor is on board, right? So if I find a problem during design, I'll give you an example. I did a hospital job in Canada, did a design review, and someone had put a multi-leaf VCD in front of every VAV box on the primary side. It was just a junior engineer, it was a mistake, you don't need that, so we got them all taken out. So I charged $5,000 for that review, and we saved $60,000 in cost. And all it took was someone opening a CAD drawer and going, delete, 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 delete. Literally took 15 minutes. Now, if I'd have found that in construction, one of them dampers would be in there for the next 30 years, fully open, never being used. And it would have been too embarrassing and too expensive to take them out, right? So that is a value, a clear example of value from design review, right? The problem with finding examples of value, they're normally retrospective, right? It's really hard to go in and, and forward that. So, the point is, if you can find things early, you flatten the curve. You have a choice on a job. You eat your problems late and expensive, or you eat them early, right? When you're playing the hard contractual game and pushing things down, you wind up eating all your problems late and expensive. And then the game becomes who owns the money. KPIs, just have a quick talk about KPIs. So if you're a project manager, the KPIs are cost, time, quality, right? The whole triangle, all good. I would argue the best KPI on any job is how many RFIs have been written. Right? So what is the job of a design document? To communicate clearly what to build and how to build it and what standards to build it to, right? So there's two types of RFI in the world. There's the ones where contractors can't be bothered to read the spec or the documents, so you just answer them, please read the spec. But there's genuine RFIs where they open the drawings and the drawings are not coordinated properly, there's mistakes on them, there's errors and omissions. And those RFIs lead to change orders, right? Because if it's a legitimate question and they found a problem, that means there has to be a cost-based solution to that, right? So the, R the RFIs, in my opinion, are a referendum on the quality of the design documents. If you go on a job and there's a gazillion, gazillion being a technical term, RFIs, that tells me the design was incomplete or uncoordinated or just plain not good. And then the contractors have a legitimate way, but way to get extra money, good for them. But the problem with that is you wind up never knowing how many you're gonna find as you go along, right? So what the disaster is, you're like a month before handover and then all of a sudden a massive problem erupts out of nowhere. So RFIs are a referendum on your design team. So if you're doing a design, if you're a design and build contractor, Judge your design team on the RFIs that come out of their work. When I go on a job, if I get on a job late and I've not been engaged during design phase, I always write my RFI, right? I always get it in there early. And I write what's basically on this slide. Again, I'm not gonna read it out to you, but you know, please tell me what standard you designed this to, you know, what I'm testing it to, What's the leakage, design leakage rate of the shaft? What's the design leakage rate of the duct work? And get an answer. Some answers, sometimes they just plain don't answer them, right? And then a method statement. Do you guys work with method statements here? You don't really do that in America. No? So in other jurisdictions, a method statement is where you have to 
before you do the work, you have to describe how you're going to do it in a safe way. And then if someone dies, you go to jail. They pull the meth state around. Oh, yeah, right. Didn't do that. Boom. It's a UK thing. But, eh? Yeah. So it's, they matter. And again, they've got to reflect what's going on, particularly with life safety systems, right? So this is the normal reaction I get when I tell a design engineer I'm going to review do a commissionability review. Gotta love Mel Gibson, right? It's an Australian American Scotsman. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to, you can't emphasize this enough. I see a lot of tab engineers and a lot of commission engineers adopting design responsibility without knowing it. You have to be careful how you write these reports, you have to clarify what you are and aren't doing. And what you're not doing is a first principles design review, right? That's a design engineer records job. You are checking that 80% of this work is commissionability. Is everything here I need to commission this? Is there anything missing? Is it all in the right order, right? But there are also the other 20% is you're looking at the drawings in detail. You're going to find errors and omissions that some people have missed. There's nothing wrong with that. You just say, it. I was looking at the drawings, I saw this, this, and this, letting you know or you see good practice issues. I don't think there's any code in the world that says you can't have 20 foot of flexible duct, but if I see that, I get a little bit triggered, right? Because it's just not a good idea, but there's nothing that says you can't do that. So that is a good practice observation, right? It's good practice to do X, Y, and Z. You can say that as long as you caveat it, that you're not, this isn't a design intervention. This is, oh, I see this. Do you, engineer of record, want to take that on board? And it is the engineer of records job to take your commissionability review and answer it. Yes, I see what you're doing there. No, I'm okay with that. Right, boom. And then it's on the record, right? So do not adopt design responsibility. And try, does anyone here do design phase commissioning plans? Anyone done that? Got one, yes? Yeah, that's good, there's a few. Right, that's good. You're doing it anyway, right? You're writing that plan anyway, whether you're doing it late or early. Do it early and get it into the job early, and then people can't say they didn't know, right? <laughs> That's the point. So construction phase. These are the documents I want to review, and this is a construction phase process. So the big thing for me at Start Construction is having a kickoff meeting. So anyone here know that, guys? Unbox Therapy, YouTube? No? Am I just like a 58-year-old teenager who watches YouTube? Looks that way. Okay. Right, so this guy is bigger than Joe Rogan, right? He does unbox therapy. He just unboxes stuff, and it's pretty funny. So for me, the project kickoff meeting is like the unboxing meeting for the project. I like to get everyone in the room and then just go through that commissioning plan. This is what we're doing. This is what we're not doing. This is who's responsible for what. This is when we're doing it. Are there any questions? And I have like a almost like a political rally where you just have everyone ask every question until there's no more questions. So that way you've got this, some good things come out of that. One, everyone's had it explained to them who the commissioning person is. It's not a magic person, it's not a wizard, they're not gonna fix design problems, right? And also there's like this, okay, we're officially in play now, we're going forward. And you can't say you weren't there and you make yourself accessible and you make yourself, I treat it like almost like a, kickoff meeting and seminar, assuming most people don't understand commissioning, which is pretty much most people. So again, I'd recommend you doing that. It's a really good tool, and it's a way of sort of reducing conflict early, because some people come in and go, oh, if I can ask commissioning guy, I'm gonna get this dude now, right? Don't want that. So the idea is to keep the conflict low through just answering any question that comes up. And this network diagram here, this is the construction phase commissioning uh, process set out in logical order. I can't read it here because it's too small on my screen. So let's carry on. So let's get into commissioning phase. So I break commissioning phase as a Brit. We we talk about static completion. What that means is the installation 100% complete before start up and power on. Right. So all, all the grills there, all the devices fitted. You know, all the doors on, and then. Dynamic commissioning is once power is on and things are started up, right? And that's when we start doing functional performance testing. So I break down commissioning from like power on, sort of like functional performance testing, and then IST as a separate phase. 
And this is what I'm doing here. God, I wish I could read this slide. <laughs> anyway, these are the things. So what we're emphasizing here, if you look at the first block, right? So there's emergency lighting and commissioning. Now, functional performance testing for me, and I think this is correct, and I'll fight anyone to the death who says otherwise, um, is about the system, right? So I am functionally performance testing the emergency lighting system, the backup power system the air system, the fire alarm system, right? So at this phase, I'm not interested in how they interconnect. I'm just making sure that they're started up, they're tested, and they work individually as a standalone system. And they can be done in parallel, right? You know, the tab guy can work in parallel with the fire alarm person, right? There's no problem with that, right? Then the test and balancing person is gonna wrap up, and hopefully that's when we start getting into the you know, is this really working or not? Because it's the test and balancing person. It's the first person that works out if there's problems with pressure, airflow, door closes, right? These are the people that really start getting into the what's really going on. So has anyone, tab people, has anyone here tested a staircase pressurization system, had it go through no problem first time? Anyone? Okay, that's consistent with everywhere else I've worked as well. I was, I was frightened you guys might be super good. <laughs> So the point is, the test and balancing person starts to become very important in this process, right? And this is, the problems they find have to be addressed, and then we've got to get them resolved. And then this is where you've got to have this whole team thing going on, right? The system. The test and balancing person cannot solve a controls issue, a leaky shaft issue on their own. It, this has to be driven by the commissioning authority as part of the commissioning team, and it has to be include the general contractor and the subcontractors, right? Then we're gonna get into the functional performance scripts. So again, this is NFPA 3. Who knew, right, NFPA 3. So they have some um, sort of like generic scripts at the back. The problem with generic scripts is they're generic. So in my view, everything generic is like 80%. You still gotta put on the 20% that makes it like real and job specific. So the functional performance testing, again, this is where the commissioning people come in. So the individual specialists have done their work, the tab guys found the problems and they've been fixed. And now we're doing the functional performance testing of the system, right? And the various systems within it. So we're functionally gonna performance test the lighting system, the power system. Um, you're testing that power you know, with, with the standby fuel as well. Um, we're testing the air system, we're testing the control system, the fire alarm system, right? all the PA system, the interlock with the elevator and the fire alarm system, that one. 40 years in, I've never seen that work first time. Everyone goes, oh, who's wiring that up? Turns out nobody. Um, that's always a change order. So you're making sure that's done, right? So at the end of this process, individually, you'll be able to put your hand on your heart and say, individually, these systems will work, right? And this is a really important point here, right? There are 100 variations on the staircase pressurization system. I'm looking at a job in Dubai at the moment where some genius value engineered the sheet metal duct work out and decided they were gonna do it in sheetrock. Awesome. Obviously not working, yeah. I've worked on a job in Dubai where they value engineered out the pressure relief dampers. Money, right? Who cares? Because this is the problem with value engineering. Everyone who makes that decision is long gone when the building's on fire and everyone's running down the stairs, right? So the problem with value engineering is there's no consequences to a bad work, which is the story of our whole industry. But the other thing that really matters here is, I've been talking about systems and quality of staircase and quality of everything. This performance of this system, the fragility or not of this system, comes down to a static pressure sensor somewhere in that staircase, right? So talking about, imagine your mum running down them steps and her life depends on a $250 sensor that you're hoping has been calibrated, set up properly, and is working properly as part of that whole system. Feeling comfortable with that? I know I'm not. <laughs> now on high rises and multiple, um, on super high rises, there's multiple sensors, hopefully there's VFDs, but there are single points of failure here, right? And as a commissioning authority agent, engineer, you've got to focus on these. You've got to test these to destruction. There is an optimum set point for that. 
So it's a single point of failure, but it's also a single point of effectiveness, right? There's never, I've never had a controls engineer come to me and say, Adam, give me the uh, set point for that set of pressure sense. I really need it so I finish my job. They just go, yeah, I've just set that at 50, I'm out of here, boom. Right? So it's on the commissioning person to bring that together and make sure that set point is in. It's an empirical set point. So it's not like, a, well, I think it's 250 PA or an inch. You know, it's, I've tested it and based on all the various factors and leakage rates, that needs to be this, right? And it's an empirical set point and it's recorded in multiple places in that commission report. Ideally, there's a schematic and there's a number on there so that if the FM team need to reset it or change it out, they can. Right? Testing the pressure relief damper, but th that as a single point of failure, a single point of fragility has to be investigated very, very intensely during the commissioning process. Again, this is, if you get a PDF of this, this is all high res, so you can blow it up. There are lots of, I love the word KPI, right? Because I've got a degree in project management, so. NFPA have requirements for how fast should the damper open? How fast should a damper open and then a fan start? How fast should the standby power come on? Right? There are, for, so this, this, this is just for a North American audience. This is just a series of requirements that need to be tested and verified that are called out in all them documents I had in that earlier slide. So there are standards for um, the fire alarm levels, the lighting levels, the standby power, right? how fast everything happens, what sequence it all happens in. These are all called out in NFPA. And in theory, the commissioning agent is supposed to know them, put them into their functional testing and record them right? as a record. So again, that's what this is. So if you want that, you can get it and you can just open now. But this goes down to like, you know, the damper should open this so many seconds and the fan should start in so many seconds. Right, IST. This is really what it's all about. This is the culmination of everything and this is what matters. So IST, integrated systems testing. What this is, is how does this system interface with this system, right? So if you go back to the systems diagram, we got staircase, we got ductwork, we got fire alarm, PA, elevators, lighting, blah, 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 right? These all have to work in conjunction with each other and they're designed to work in conjunction with each other, right? And there are interfaces, some hardware, some software interfaces between them. These have to be tested during integrated systems testing. So this is the, uh, this is the network, logic network for that. So what are the inputs to this? You need a cause and effect matrix. So what's a cause and effect matrix? Uh, let's see, let's use this, right? So this is how I explain it. When there's a fire event or an event, right? Fire alarm gets pulled. A series of things happen, right? The air, certain air handling units go off. Um, the elevator's ground. Certain things come on, certain things go off, and this all happens in a certain order. That is the cause is the fire alarm pull and the effects are this, 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 and this. So that, that's normally, presented in a matrix format, and that has to be tested. That's the IST test. And when you demonstrate the staircase pressurization system, you're supposed to demonstrate it on standby power, because that's its, its normal sort of like working mode, right? That's the mode when your mum's running down the stairs, the generator's come on, there's enough fuel in it, it's kicked in, everything's running, and mum gets out, right? So that's, you have to test it in that mode. And you have to test, so there's, there's a series of tests you do, and they, they're called out here, but there's a series of tests like, you start off with a condition that is normal, right? Then you set the fire alarm off, then you see the things come on, then you test it, then you see it go back on to normal power. All these sequences have to be tested. Now, let's say we've done all that, right? Anyone here seen this HBO show, Chernobyl? Awesome, right? It's like car crash TV. It's so grim, but you can't stop watching it. It's so good, right? And at the end of this show, because I'm a nerd, and so the end of the show is the trial. They're trying to work out who did what, and obviously this is Russia. Someone's got to go against the wall and get shot, right? So there's some poor guy who was put in charge of cleaning this all up and he gets up and makes a speech and he describes why this thing blew up, right? And what he describes is a cascade failure. 
this didn't get done, and this didn't get done, which led to this, which led to this, which led to boom, right? So what he gets up and says is, the problems on this job was, no one could speak to power and hear the word no, right? That's generally, a general contractors can be a bit like that. And he said, and because the job was late and no one could hear the word no, we didn't do any IST and we didn't test the standby generator, which meant a, a valve that should have opened to bring cooling in didn't open. Boom, 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 cascade, cascade, bang. So Chernobyl, turns out, blew up because it wasn't commissioned properly with IST testing. True story, if you believe HBO, which I do, because all the actors were Brits. <laughs> But, you know, it's, when I read that, when I was watching that on my like, third beer, because it's all a bit depressing, you realise you've seen that movie, right? I've seen that movie on a big jobs where they're late and everyone's got reputations at state and, you know, damages are going to kick in if you don't hand over. So what happens? Don't tell me no, son. Come in and get that done, right? Oh, you've got to test that. Do that out of hours. If you can't do it, don't worry. We'll push it into later and later never comes, right? And with life cycle, with fan core units, you know, doesn't matter. You get hot, you get cold, no one dies. Low safety systems, it really does matter. And because there's this, like, who owns it? Is it the authority having jurisdiction? Is it the uh, professional engineer, engineer of record at the end? And they're not normally there at the end, right? They've moved on to another job, or Fred's not with this firm anymore. You know, it just gets shuffled under. So the Chernobyl effect is actually real. So we're at the end, very close to the end now, you'll be glad to know. Commissioning is not about reports. I know I've already had a kick on the head of checklists, right? It's about action. There's two types of commissioning. There's process-based commissioning, which is why I don't like the ASHRAE definition, which is all paperwork driven. And it implies that if you follow this process, it's all good. And it doesn't explicitly ask you to have domain expertise or technical knowledge, right? The conceit is I follow this thing, I fill these forms in, I've met my requirements. Technically you have, right? Is that good? No. Commissioning is about results, not reports. All the commissioning report is, is a way to memorialize for the record the performance of that building when you hand it over, right? It is not a thing on and of itself, it is just a record of all the work that's been done. If it's an iceberg, the tip is the report and all the work that's been done underneath is the mass of the iceberg, right? So, you know, it's about outcomes. And as a commissioning authority, you have to answer the question, how did this system perform? How does it meet the prescribed requirements? Now, in the UK, there was a terrible fire a few years ago. A lot of people died. And Brits being Brits, they wanted to put someone in prison, it's a bit like Russia. And they couldn't find anyone to put in prison and it made them mad. And they're redoing all the building regulations, which is building code. And they're doing a thing called the golden thread. So next year, within a year's time, there's legislation coming out, which means every design decision you make on a life safety feature is going to be recorded. So it's going to be accountability via identity. The genius of Facebook was bringing identity to software, right? So what this means is if you make a design decision or any decision related to that system, your names could be on it, and heaven forbid someone dies, they're going to go through that and work out who effed up, and you're going to jail. You can watch that come here. Things tend to get over the Atlantic about five or ten years later, so you can enjoy that. I'll be retired. But this will come to commissioning people, right? Because the design matters, and then there's the proving the efficacy of that system at the end to hand it over, right? So that golden thread, is what they're calling it, is going to reach all the way down to commissioning, in my opinion. So the report is a record, and these are all the documents that should be appended to that record. I'm running out of time here. So one more thing, post-occupancy testing. Again, NFPA are awesome at calling this out. So we've all done our bit, right? We've gone, we're on to the next job, our LinkedIn profile's been updated, I've got my new pitch, I'm looking good, right? And we're gone. And the FM team come in. They have a requirement to test these systems every six months and every year in certain ways, depending on what type of systems they are, and keep a record of it. So if there was a fire in America and an insurance company phoned me up and said, Adam, I do not want to pay this claim, get me out of it. I would just walk into that job, go to the FM team and say, show me all these test reports. Ever since you this bill was handed over, show me you've done it, show me the record, I want to see the results. Pretty sure I won't find that. And my client would not be paying that claim. 
But again, we are moving to a world of evidence-based design based on identity and evidence-based results based on identity. At some point, it is not going to be possible to dodge these things. So we should try and get our clients on board with this. Commissioning records are evidentiary records, right? They matter. And if something goes wrong, they will definitely matter because some lawyer is going to get hold of them, right? So make them right and be accountable for it. But one of the things I do in the wrap-up meetings, I try and have a meeting with the FM team and make them aware of their obligations to test these systems. A lot of them will do the generator test, you know, I turn the generator on and do that. Right? But I don't know any of them. I've never met anyone who does the actual testing and record it. So these, these, are, these are called out on these slides. So that's it. Whew. Five minutes, Q&A. Okay, go. <laughs> well, what percentage of, uh, so we have to issue, uh, the whole team produces a smoke control permit where we're at. Yeah. And so essentially it's like you have to have the testing plan, you have to have the design, it all goes in during construction, yeah. the construction team identifies who's gonna do what. Do you see that anywhere else? No, so again, different jurisdictions have different requirements and America's like 50 jurisdictions now together with paper clips, right? So everywhere you go, there's a different requirement. So the permitting system is very strong in the US. My experience with that is, yes, that permit's in place and there's a plan there, right? It's the follow through that's normally missing, the execution of that plan and the testing, the evidence and the report. And so there's a, it's a bit of a, like a collective, I go, well, I've got the permit, we're all good, right? And then the thinking just stops at that point, right? It's a bit like um, design engineer of record designs a staircase pressurization system, right? He's a professional engineer, stamps that drawing, boom, good, four years of college, paid off, right? Authority having jurisdiction comes along and he's seen the CFD, he's seen that stamped design. That guy's been to college for four years, he must know what he's doing, he stamped that report. I can just say yes to this, right? And then there's no, there's this gap of like evidence and testing and verification, which historically we've all got away with to some degree. And the more permits and the more officials involved, the more, strangely, the more you get away with it because everyone thinks, well, I've got this permit, I'm good. I've got this, this guy's come and had a meeting with me, I'm good, right? But I think we're gonna be moving away from that to evidence. So, you know, it's, Unfortunately, the way it will manifest itself is the way it did in the UK with this horrible fire where people died. It takes an event to create a change, right? And what it will do in our business, it will create someone you know getting sued and put out of business to create that accountability going forward. So where we live, you have to produce a smoke control permit. Yeah. We, we write a testing plan as a third yeah. party agency. The designer of record has to come out and witness after we're all said right. and done that the building operates as designed and then you issue a 72 hour letter to the authority having jurisdiction and then you come out and essentially perform yeah. an integrated systems test for the authority having jurisdiction. Does that include all the other systems like the, the lighting, the power? So it does yeah. include emergency generator. Uh, yeah. EM lighting is starting to make its way more into that requirement, yeah. but as far as just like the smoke control system, stairwell organization, yeah. that is not part of it right now. Yeah. Like it's just... I mean, that sounds like quite a formal process, actually, and that's unusual what you've just described. I don't see that in many places. Um, America is a bit more... So the projects... I've, I've worked in America a lot over my career, and it's interesting here because there's this quite a litigious place and there's consequences sometimes if you really scrub, right? And there's a lot of formality on permitting here. And that makes, sometimes that can lead to a more sort of like rigid, better outcome. But it's a bit hit and miss depending what jurisdiction you're in within the states, right? Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's even worse here. Like we are from a home rule state, so yeah. every city has its own set of building codes. <laughs> This is just one. Yeah, so there's layers and layers and layers and layers. So in, in Australia, they went down the um, free market self-certification route. Uh, fast forward five years, there are several towers. There's one in particular in Sydney that is literally falling down because everyone self-certified it to death and value engineered it to death. And there's literally there's cracks, there's high rise. It's literally in danger of being condemned at the moment. So 
you know, that's the opposite end of what you just described, right? You've got self-certification at one end and you've got sort of bureaucracy at the other. And I think the way you square all of that is with independent verification that stands as a record. And then if there's something going wrong, you can go, right, well, that, we, we verified it on that day. What's happened since? Or did, did that, was that verification correct? You know, was that performance actually met? But I just think accountability, evidence is just going to become more and more and more part of our daily work, right? The days of winging it and tick listing it are coming to an end as long with my career, so that's good news for me. <laughs> I'm 58, so I'm old, sorry. Adam, you, you showed and taught the single point of failure and single point of effectiveness. Yeah. You know, I've seen design or leave with multiple. I mean, you have a, I mean, and yeah, we know the engineer writer that you're talking yeah. about is the owner of this, but do you have your personal preference of seeing if there's multiple or do you like that single point of failure? I like to see more than one sensor. I like to see more than one sensor, even in a, like a, a low-rise or mid-rise building. Was it one is none and two is one? You know, you need to, if this is someone's life might be on the line here, you need to, right? Um, but if you're the cost engineer, value engineering that out is easy, right? Oh, it's only five stories, let's just have one. Honestly, yeah. where we are, that we get rid of the sensors and just do the, when the fan, when the smoke control system is enabled, it just goes. The fan just runs at a set speed. Because those doors in a dynamic situation yeah. are opening and closing, and if you're testing with a pressure sensor that is yeah. under static conditions, that's not realistic for you know giving people five minutes to get yeah. out of the building. So I like those designs where it's just it goes flat out, yeah. and there's a pressure relief damper to make sure doors all can open. Because yeah. that that for me is robust because it's simple. So this is the other sort of conundrum, right? It's got to be sustainable, it's got to be, and ev everyone reads that as complexity. The most sustainability is born in um, simplicity, and resilience and, re and robustness is born in simplicity, right? So I love those systems because they at work. I'd feel more comfortable with that, signing that off than just about anything, quite frankly. Because the minute you've got like this $250 static pressure sensor in there, that's a point of failure. Someone might knock it off, someone might not calibrate it, it could, wires could come, you know, there's so many things that go wrong with that, right? Am I on time? Am, am I on time or? So we need to maybe take one more question. Okay. So. Anyone? <coughs> okay. All right. So if you need a copy of anything or um, let us know. If you want to contact me, please contact me. I'm all over the internet like a crazy person. So, you know, and I don't get much attention. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>